18 years ago, Nehemiah Gordon walked into my apartment in Jerusalem and said, you've got to see this. He had been studying, researching the ancient Hebrew Matthew, and he said, what Yeshua says here is absolutely brilliant. I realized at the time, I've never heard a Christian pastor ever say, you gotta listen to this, what Yeshua says here is absolutely brilliant. But what he laid out before me then turned into the book, Nehemi Gordon's first book, The Hebrew Yeshua Versus the Greek Jesus. And this is what began opening the door for me uh, to more fully understand the gospel of the kingdom that Yeshua was teaching. And without his research in the the Hebrew Matthew and his input into uh, the chronological gospels, I could never have produced the chronological gospels. I'd been working on these things for 38 years at the time, but there were key elements that were were, were missing that were absolutely essential. And so it was seven years after that date that Nehemia walked into my office in Charlotte, North Carolina. And he began telling me the story about what he was referring to as the Smithfield Revival, something that happened to him. And this was just before Shavuot, and that turned into what became the Open Door series, a prayer to our Father, which is uh, the first in this series that was done at Shavuot that year. And then at Yom Teruah, proclaim the name, and then finally, at Hanukkah that year, stand against the ban. And that's when we joined Nehemiah Gordon in standing against the ban, against the name, a ban that the rabbis put in place. And what became of that is over a thousand ancient Hebrew manuscripts with the name, with all the vowel pointings. And ladies and gentlemen, we, we have Nehemiah back here again. Seven years later, this is after we, we've done several things, ladies and gentlemen, Nehemiah Gordon. Nehemiah, it's great to have you here. So Mike, it's great to be back here. You know, we had a, a conversation uh, uh, last year. I called you up at the beginning of 2018 and I said, Michael, we've been searching these Hebrew manuscripts for the name Yehovah with the full vowels and we now have access to more manuscripts than I ever thought I would have access to in my entire life. Uh, one of the things that happened in the last really two, around two years is there's been a worldwide push to digitize all these manuscripts, put them online. And just to give you some context, uh, I uh, f- had found two manuscripts with those vowels back in 2001. And then over the years, I found a third and then a fourth. And then in the uh, summer of, uh, I believe it was around 2015, I, I wanted to get a fifth. I had this burning desire in my heart to get a fifth. And it required me to ultimately drive around the United States on an 8,000 mile circuit journey that led me to the Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati, which has one of the key Masoretic Bible manuscripts. And I went there so I could find manuscript number five. I didn't know what I would find. I didn't know if I would open that manuscript and see those full vowels of God's holy name, Yehovah, in Hebrew. But I finally got there and saw the, that manuscript, and that was number five. And that was in the summer. The following, uh, uh, really, uh, December and going into January, I uh, started to look for more manuscripts. And my goal at that time, and recently I looked at one of my old emails, the goal at that time was to get to 10 manuscripts. And I thought, how will I do this in my entire life? If I spend the re- if it took me all uh, these how, years, how many years all together? Right. So, uh, had so, you spent up to this point? Well, so uh, 2001 until I think it was 2016 at that point. So that's 15 years. I had five manuscripts. That's on average one every three years. So I thought, okay. So to get to uh, 10 manuscripts will take another 15 years. Uh, not only have we exceeded 10 manuscripts, we did a program, and that was, uh, I believe it was called, I don't know if it was the Karite Files or the yeah. Gentiles Shall Know My Name. Yeah, but, yeah. But, and, 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 and each one of these is an absolute treasure. Just I chock mean, full of information. Hours right. of, of uh, biblical research that exceeds anything that's been done in hundreds of years, right. literally. Well, so uh, I, we shared in one of those series about how we got to 52 by Shavuot, and uh, that the Gentiles shall mo- know my name. And then I called you up in January of 2018, and I said, Michael, we're way past 52. We've reached 1,000. That was 1,000. So my goal in life was to get to 10. <laughs> and within a year, instead of getting to 10, we got to 1,000 manuscripts with the name Yehovah, with the full vowels. Well, Michael, as of this recording, right now at this moment, 
By the time this is broadcast, this will be out of date. We'll have more manuscripts. But as right, of right if, now, if we if we recorded it yesterday, it would be out of oh, a date literally today. Literally, last night I I went to bed at like 1 a.m. and it was a different number. We found more since then. The number is 1,721 as of right now. Manuscripts with the full vowels of the name, and that's after having looked in over 7,000 manuscripts. Because not every Hebrew Bible manuscript has those vowels Yehovah. Usually, one of the vowels is missing. Uh, and the name is unpronounceable the way it's written, but mm -hmm. there's 1,721 manuscripts known so far with those full vowels. They range in the entire gambit, the entire uh, period of manuscripts that have vowels in the Hebrew text. The earliest dated ones that we know of are from the 9th century AD all the way up until the 19th century. Uh, you know, in, in most places they stopped making Hebrew Bible manuscripts by the 15th century, but in Yemen, for example, which was an isolated Jewish community that never developed printing, they still continue to copy the Bible by hand. A father to son, scribe to a, a disciple, copying it by hand, and even there they put the vowels Yehovah. Now, I have some new exciting discoveries that- Okay, that, that, that's why that you're here. here. We can't, we can't okay. wait. So, so we've continued this push, and I remember, um, uh, a couple years back, I was speaking to a very good friend, and we had we were pushing for a hundred manuscripts at the time, right? We had hit, hit fifty-two, and I said, "Okay, let's try to get to a hundred. And and my goal at that point was to get to a hundred by the end of the year. Now, I remember a, a few weeks after the end of the year, we reached a thousand, right? But the goal was to get to a hundred by the end of the year. And this man said to me, "Why do you need a hundred?" Uh, you, when are you gonna stop? And I said, why would I ever stop? <laughs> and, and really my goal is to search every Hebrew Bible manuscript, every printed Bible that was ever made, every source I can find to verify what vowels they have of the name. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, we because started- Because this, this, uh, yeah. this is, will lead us to the correct pronunciation of the name, which has been you know, theorized you know, about and look, Michael, and speculation. I had, I had an experience, what I believe was a God experience in 2001. And that's, in a way, that was a really personal experience that it was very difficult for me to share with people. In my tradition, you don't, you don't share that, those kinds of things with people. And I would gradually share it with people and eventually people are like, look, you gotta tell people about this. You can't just tell your, you know, your friends. You gotta, you gotta tell people about this. And I shared that experience in the series we did, uh, in the Open Door series. It was right. in Albuquerque, New Mexico. It was the second, second session section there of mm -hmm. the Open Door series. I finally shared that. And I think was... I had shared that in a few other places with small groups. But I shared it with the world and proclaimed the name. Proclaimed um, the name. That that was it. That was and, uh, when um, you shared that, and yeah. you know, I I I I, I literally wept. Uh, you know, in when I go back into this, uh, your personal experience, uh, you know, I can I can relate to it. This was a know, real thing. And, and for me, it was a real thing. But but I come from an academic background, Michael. So this was a God experience I had had, and that's very personal for me. But when I approach these types of things, I I I also need to just because of the way my, my Litvak brain is wired, and if you don't know what that is, guys, go watch the series, <laughs> uh, uh, Open Door series. My, my Litvak brain, the way it's wired, is that I have to put my personal beliefs aside and always uh, take a fresh approach and look at a question. And so when the man said to me, why don't you stop when you reach 100? When will you ever stop? And I said, why would I ever stop? What I was really asking is, well, if I looked at 100 manuscripts and I found the vowels Yehovah, and let's say at that time that was out of 500 manuscripts, right? Uh -huh. Well, what if I looked at another 100 and found the vowels Yahweh or Yahuwah or some other set of vowels? Mm -hmm. I need to look at all the evidence that I possibly can to establish uh, what is it, at the very least, what did the Jewish scribes who transcribed the name, what did they believe the vowels to be, mm -hmm. right? Because look, here's what we can't do. We cannot go back in time and ask or listen in as, as uh, God is speaking to Moses from the burning bush. So I can so I can have my faith and believe have beliefs about that. But what I can establish with solid factual evidence is the Jewish scribes who preserved the oracles of God throughout the ages. What did they believe the vowels to be? And they pretty consistently transcribed the vowels when they put in the full set of vowels as Yehovah. Now there's some exceptions we found. We actually found a single manuscript, Michael, where there was different vowels. And, and I've shared some other minor variations in the past on your program, but we found, this is a new discovery, instead of Yehovah, we found one manuscript where it's Yehovah. Now, hmm. you can start an entire denomination and say the true name of the creator of the universe is Yehovah, but to be honest with you, that's one manuscript out of over 7,000, and even within that manuscript, it's only in one passage. 
I call that a scribal error. How do I know it's a scribal error? Because I have this massive bulk of evidence where in all the other manuscripts, 1,721, it's Yehovah. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's important. Now, one of the things we started looking at, um, is, and then I want to give credit to T-Bone. T-Bone is this, this genius who, who, who helps me with this research and there's other people who do. I want to give credit to, to Don and John and other people who have, have really been pushing and helping with this research, looking through manuscripts to uh, Ian and Nicole in New Zealand. We have people all around the world who are involved in this project, Michael, looking at manuscripts, uh, Aaron in, in, in Dallas, all kinds of people. Many of them are believers in Yeshua, incidentally. Um, mm -hmm. and, and they just feel this calling to, um, to, to do this, to, to, mm -hmm. to help and do this. And, um, and, and so I want to give credit to T-Bone because one of the things he's- Yeah, really no, he, he won't even receive it because that's why you call him T-Bone because you, you're not even allowed to say his real name. Well, he, he's, he's a very humble person, um, and he truly is a, 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 <laughs> but, an incredible- But without him, I mean, this is thousands of manuscripts oh, oh. that-, that so, uh, so, so I can, you know, and I'm a very analytical reader, so when I sit down to examine a manuscript, I'm looking at every word and every jot and every tittle, and so for me to get through a 900-page manuscript, that's my the course of my entire career. We literally, guys, uh, I don't know if we should be telling people this, but we, we, we were sitting at your kitchen table, Michael, and we asked T-Bone, we had him on speakerphone, he said, T-Bone, we're, we're doing this research, I can't actually share what it's about, because it's, <laughs> it's exciting oh, stuff, right, right. but it will be revealed in due time. <laughs> okay. But he said, T-Bone, we need an answer to this. This is, a, 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 and I think it was a something like a 360-something page manuscript, and I said, T-Bone, can you go through and check for this one little, uh, almost like a jot and tittle, it was this one little symbol that could appear anywhere on the page, and, 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 and we're having the conversation the next morning at breakfast, and you're like, do you think he's gonna be done by the deadline? I said, oh, no, no, you don't understand, he's done. He stayed up till 3.30 in the morning and went through a 360 plus page manuscript and looked at every jot and tittle, and he found this thing that we were looking for. And now yeah. we can actually begin to have a definitive answer to certain questions that in the past it was like, good luck with that. Right, get a team, right. get a team of PhDs and professors, and they and they still would spend their entire career. And T Bone went through and found this thing in one night. So one of the things he's pushing for, and I really want to give him credit, is he's coming from a very similar perspective as you, Michael. And he says, Nehemi, you're looking at the Tanakh. I also want to look at the New Testament. T Bone says, I have this burning desire to find the name of Yehovah in the New Testament if it's there. Mm -hmm. And so he was with me over the summer in Israel, and we start to look at these manuscripts, which we we had discovered in these catalogs, but to actually be able to see them, it's not so simple. So we go to, the, we're sitting in the basement of the National Library of Israel and we start pulling manuscript after manuscript. And I wanna just share a little taste of what we found. Can I, can I do please, that? Pl please, please do. Okay. Please. So, I, I, I have to tell you, uh, folks, uh, before this, uh, this is gonna take us a while. Uh, you know, in the hot tub, it was like four hours in the hot tub at breakfast <laughs> this morning. It was more than two hours. You're only gonna get a little bit of this, but I'm gonna have you at Passover this year. There is just so much that, that you've got in some of these uh, these Greek manuscripts. I'm not gonna say any more about it right now, so, but so, there has been incredible things that we've been looking for hundreds of years, hundreds of years. Well, I personally haven't been looking at it for hundreds of years, but, <laughs> but scholars have been looking at this topic really since the time of, of for nearly 2,000 years, they've been, been talking about it, and for 400 years for sure this has been an issue. So we're gonna st share stuff at Passover. You're gonna give me a chance to share at Passover? Absolutely. Stuff that there's no way we have time to share in this in this coming series of, of Shabbat Night Live, but we can get into a lot more depth. Well, I got, I got chills just like I did, did it at the <laughs> breakfast table this morning. Uh, I, I'm really looking forward to this. I'm and excited, so, okay. I'm excited. Um, but here's just a little taste of what okay. we found. now. I've talked in the series called The Lost Treasures of the Vatican about oh, Hebrew yeah, New Testament yeah. manuscripts. Some people misunderstood what I talked about. Guys, I want you to go back and look at that, watch the series. Some people were saying, how can Nehemiah say this is the first century copy written by John himself? Uh, that's not what I said. This was a right. 17th century manuscript copied from an earlier manuscript, which in turn was presumably copied from an earlier manuscript. Mm -hmm. um, is it a translation from some other language or a Hebrew original? These are, are exciting vistas of research that are still open and need to be investigated. For example, you, I, I won't even go into it. You have incredible things there that I've learned since I did that series with you, Michael. For example, you have um, 
uh, confusion between Sere and Segel and Kamatz and Patach, which is a characteristic of something called the Palestino-Tiberian vocalization. I mean, there's some exciting things in this manuscript that uh, that uh, from the Vatican, which which is really needs to be researched serious, be seriously by scholars. I've only just touched the surface because I'm doing so many other things. But here's one of the documents we know 100% without a question was translated and we know what language it was translated from. Okay, so this okay. is a, a manuscript that's never been shown before to the public. Uh, you would have to go to the National Library of Israel in the basement and you, there you can see it in black and white or you could go to Uppsala, which I wanna say is in Sweden. Uh, Uppsala University, and there they have a unique manuscript, and I uh, got there, you know, wrote to them and contacted them and got them to produce for me a color photograph, which we're showing here for the first time. Okay, this is so it. So this is a color photograph of a manuscript of the Gospel of Matthew in Hebrew, and we know for a fact it was translated. We know what it was translated from and by whom. So this is not a Hebrew original. Okay. But this is a translation into Hebrew, but we can still learn some incredible things from this manuscript about the translator and about the Jews of this period, and I think even about the Gospels. So this is Matthew chapter three, translated by a man named Johann Kemper. Now, Johann Kemper of Uppsala, Sweden, he was not uh, born Johann Kemper. He was born Moshe of Krakow. He was a Jew who converted to Lutheranism, moved to Sweden, from Poland and decided, I want to bring my Jewish brothers along into this faith. And in order to do that, I need to translate the Gospels into Hebrew. Uh, he was not a Greek expert. So he translated the Gospels from Syriac. Hmm. Syriac is a dialect of Aramaic, the Pshita, you know about it well, right. Michael. Mm -hmm. And he could read that because he was an educated Jewish rabbi. And any educated Jewish rabbi, or even not rabbi, any really educated Jew should be able to read Aramaic fluently. It's, it's, it's part of the culture of the Jewish people. And so he read this in Aramaic, translated it into Hebrew from the Aramaic. And here we have in Matthew chapter three, verse three, translated from the Syriac into uh, Hebrew. And it's talking about John. And it says, This is the one concerning which Isaiah the prophet prophesied, Kol a voice crying out in the wilderness, Penu derech, make straight the way, and there it says in the Hebrew, Yehovah, yud hey vav hey. Now, ah. we know he translated it from Syriac, but he also knows the verse in the Tanakh, the origin mm -hmm. in Isaiah, and so for his Jewish audience, who's the target audience here, he says, if I want the Jews to understand this, I can't put in Lord, I have to, for it to be authentic, I have to put in yud -Hey vav -Hey. Now, he doesn't put vowels in his text. However, on the opposite page of each page of the translation of Moshe of Krakow, he puts the Latin, and in the Latin, he writes, Yehovah. Now, in, ah. Eng in English, people call that Jehovah, but in the right. Latin, it's actually pronounced Yehovah, and later Latin, it would be Yehovah. Uh, the point here, here's a really key point for me, Michael. And I know we're running out of time, but we might have to come back to this in the second half. So, so I'm not saying that Moshe of Krakow had a manuscript from the first century. That's not the case at all. We know mm -hmm. we translated it from Syriac, but when he wrote it for his Jewish audience, he knew he had a right Yehovah, because if he wrote anything else, the Jewish audience would say, well, that's not authentic. Well, that's not the name of the God of Israel. We know the name of the God of Israel, and it's Yehovah. And if you write Yahweh, and he could have written Yahweh, this is the 18th century, 1710 approximately. Mm. Yahweh was well established. If he had written Yahweh, he would have been laughed out of Krakow. He would have been laughed out of Uppsala by every Jew around. He had a right Yehovah because that was known to the Jews as the true pronunciation of the name. And so I think, even though we know this is translated from the Aramaic, that this is powerful evidence of what the Jews in this period knew for centuries. Seven years ago, Nehemi Gordon proclaimed the name. At Hanukkah, he then asked us to join him in standing against the ban against the name because the Almighty brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand so the whole world would know that his name is Yehovah. We stood with him, we prayed with him, and then it has turned into now 
1,721 as of this recording, as of this morning, but you're bringing more evidence here from Sweden, other manuscripts that right. were, where it was really written by a rabbi who became a Messianic Jew who wanted to communicate this to his people. Right. Tell us more. Well, so in the 1721, those are just Tanakh manuscripts, right? Oh, We're, we're that, not even talking about the New Testament manuscripts. Oh, we're, we're not talking about the that, treasures in the Vatican. Right, th those, that's, that's beyond the 1721. 1721, that's just, I mean, Michael, there's an entire world we haven't even started looking at, which is uh, prayer books, meaning there were Jews who copied prayers, and there they put in the vowels. All kinds of documents where Jews recorded the vowels that are outside of the actual Tanakh oh. of, the, of the Old Testament. Uh, we focused on that because even that's going to take us so years. So not all Jews even followed the ban that was put in place by Rome uh, well, initially. they didn't, well, that's for sure, but that's a separate issue. Meaning these rabbis who are writing the name Yehovah with those vowels, they don't pronounce it that way. Meaning it's, this is, this is really interesting, um, and I can't get into all of it right now, but basically we have all these rabbinical sources. I did a teaching on my website, nehemiaswell.com. It's called 10 Rabbis Speak Out on the Name or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I show that there's 10 rabbis, and by the way, as of today, we have 19. 19 okay. rabbis who explicitly tell us the vowels are Yehovah. And this is important because there's this misconception out there, even in, among very serious scholars, that uh, no Jew ever thought the name was Yehovah. That's just a silly mistake that the Christians made because they didn't know what they were looking at. They read the vowels of Adonai and they thought those were the vowels of the name. And I've demonstrated that there are um, at least 10 rabbis, and now, like I said, I have 19, and I'm gonna eventually share those publicly, um, who say the vowels of the name are Yehovah. And the point is when, these, uh, uh, when Moshe of Krakow was writing this New Testament for his Jewish audience, he has to put in Yehovah as the pronunciation, otherwise they'll laugh him out of the synagogue. They'll, they won't listen to anything he has to say. I don't know if they listen to him anyway, right? But, but at least mm. he had a chance to present to them what mm. he understood to be the gospel um, to the best of his ability based on what he knew. And if he'd written Yahweh, he'd be laughed out of there. Now, here's another manuscript from Uppsala, Sweden, and it's slightly later. Uh, than uh, Johann Ke uh, Kemper or Moshe Krakow. This is one of his disciples. And here it's really interesting because here he's translated the Gospels once again himself. So this is a disciple of his, then he yeah. believed in Yeshua then. Right, absolutely. This is a disciple of his who um, I believe was from a Christian background originally, mm. Um, mm. but studied Hebrew under Moshe Kemper. Uh, or Johann Kemper and continued this process of refining and translating the Gospels. This time, I, 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 I wanna say he translated it from Greek off the top of my head. But in any event, uh, when he gets the name, what does he write? He writes Yehovah and he puts in the vowels. Ah, now, ah. I'm not saying this is from the first century, quite the contrary. We know this was translated in the 18th century, but it was translated for a Jewish audience. And if you're translating it for a Jewish audience and you're putting in any vowels, they have to be the vowels, Yehovah, because those are the vowels that the audience knows to be the true vowels. Now, somebody could come along and say, well, the Jews didn't know what they were talking about. Okay, well, we're, we're, you know, all right. Wait, wait, wait. No, Paul no, says the living oracles of God were committed to the Jews. That's that, that, precisely what he says. Well, that's what Paul says, and there's no question that the, I should say there's no question, uh, in my mind at least, that when the scribes transcribe these vowels, and the standard understanding of this that scholars have is starting around the year 600, they, they, uh, tran they started to write down the vowels. They didn't invent the vowels, though. The vowels had been fixed, and they were fixed in a form at least in the first century. My book, Shattering the Conspiracy of Silence, we have it right here. I actually bring an example of a debate between these rabbis and the discussion revolves around changing the vowels. And the one rabbi says, look, we basically he says, we can't actually change the vowels, but we can pretend for interpretation as if there's different vowels than what's written. And my question is if these rabbis just made up the vowels out of the, out of the thin air, well, why didn't they just go ahead and change the vowels? Right, oh, and, and they didn't. Right. What they said is, for the purpose of interpretation, we're gonna act as if the vowels are different, but in the synagogue, we still read the original vowels. Now, were they written down, or were they transmitted orally? That's something scholars discuss, and, and Jewish sources have discussed that for 500 years, but I think what could be proven very 
uh, substantially, in my opinion, is that these vowels were fixed at least in the first century. And I recently heard a lecture from this uh, uh, professor who said, in fact, these vowels go back to the temple priesthood, that these were things that were being communicated in the temple priesthood, transmitted mm. from rabbi to disciple until finally they were written down. But it's not that they just pulled it out of the thin air. So we have these vowels, and here in the 18th century, when this professor at the University of Uppsala wants to convert Jews, and look, I'm not a Christian, I'm not a Messianic Jew, I'm looking at this. We have the uh, series here called The Karite Files. I tell people I'm a oh, Karite yeah. Jew, um, oh, very open about that. But when I'm understanding this within its context, what it tells me is these Jews who were the target audience, they knew it to be Yehovah, and I can now have that confirmed from the Jews themselves. I can show you from Jews from this period and earlier and later, who said the vowels are shva, cholam, kamat, yehovah, explicitly, not an opinion. This is a fact that this is what they said. Uh, now look, there were other opinions out there. There's one rabbi I found who says, we don't know what the vowels were. Um, there are other rabbis who say, no, it was these other vowels. But the, but the consistent message repeatedly that I'm finding is the vowels yehovah, that is then consistent with what I find in the manuscripts of the actual Bible of the Tanakh. Um, so we have these this series of sources. Now, now, Michael, one of the things I've heard from people is they say, Nehemia, we don't care if you bring, um, and I actually had a guy say to me, I don't care if you bring a thousand manuscripts. And that was uh, <laughs> long before I had a thousand manuscripts. Now it's at 1721 uh, as of today. But um, he said, I don't care if you have a thousand manuscripts. Uh, you know, I, I was taught those are the vowels of Adonai. It's what it says in my grammar book. I don't care what you say. Um, and, and we don't even trust the vowels of those Jews anyway. That's one of the arguments I've heard. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. And I want to address that. I don't think we're going to get to that this time because I want to share another type of manuscript that we recently discovered. Um, well, we're, uh, I'll, I'll say we're going to we're going to carry over. There's okay, just okay. so much that you've got. Uh, so you know. Take your time. Okay, okay, <laughs> all right. Uh, people say I talk fast, but that's because I have so much to say. Um, so Michael, one of the things we discovered, and this is literally in the last couple of weeks, um, is a set of manuscripts that were produced by the Jews of China. A thousand years ago, these Jews uh, who were Jewish um, uh, merchants came on the Silk Road, arrived in China, and asked for permission from the emperor of China to settle in China so they could uh, carry out this trade. And one of the major trade routes of the Jewish world was from uh, what today is Syria, through Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, into China. In fact, some of the earliest post-Dead Sea Scroll manuscripts that have been discovered in, with Hebrew characters are, were found in Afghanistan in Western China. Like, most people don't realize that. Jewish manuscripts with Hebrew characters in Afghanistan, because this was the international trade route, and you had Jewish communities all along the route. Now, so you, you spent some time in China. So I spent a year in China, and one of my goals in China was to visit the one surviving community of Jews in a city called Kaifeng. Kaifeng is this community in China that at one time, during the period of what was called the Northern Song Dynasty, was the capital of China in the 12th and 13th century. By that time, the Jews had been in China for two or 300 years. And mm. one of the things they were given there in China, these Jews, is you know Chinese is a language with over 20,000 characters. And we hear these Chinese words, or I should say I hear these Chinese words, and there's all these words that literally sound the same. And even to the Chinese people, they sound the same. And the only way to distinguish the, sound, the, the, the words is by the character. Mm. Mm. So they could have a single syllable that audibly is identical with 60 different unrelated meetings, and, and the way that it distinguishes is the, is the character. And I, I remember in China, I would see people, they would say some word and the other person wouldn't understand them and they draw the word on their hand, right? They draw the character. Oh, so this is why okay. they have so many characters. So the Jews of China have seven, I believe it's seven characters that are unique to Jewish surnames. These characters are not used for anything else in the Chinese language as far as I know. They were granted to the Chinese Jews by the emperor of China. And when you hear their, and their name, I think is something like Lee, right? And you're like, oh, it's a common name, like Bruce Lee. No, 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 but Bruce Lee has a different character than the Chinese Jew. Hmm. Um, so I go to visit these Chinese Jews uh, when I was there in 2014, and I actually ended up meeting with two different groups of Jews. 
and I couldn't let the other group know I was meeting with the first group. And this is how I knew they were really Jews, because they don't talk to each other, right? You have, you have two communities, actually three communities, three communities of Jews, and they're not on speaking terms. It proves they're Jewish. Um, Michael, there's an old joke about a Jew who's stranded alone on a desert island. And he's there for years on the desert island. And finally, he decides, I'm going to take some uh, uh, you know, coconut trees, cut them down, and build myself a synagogue. But then he realizes, no, I have to build a second synagogue. And when they find him years later, they say, well, why did you need two synagogues? You're one guy. He said, I, the first one I go to every Shabbat, the second one I wouldn't be caught dead in. <laughs> so, it's, you know, so, I mean. It, so in China, yeah. they're doing that. They're it separate. proves they're a they, bunch of Jews. All right, so I go and I meet these Jews, and they show me these incredible monuments. These, uh, it says in, in, the, in the municipal museum there, in the, in the attic, hidden away, are these three monuments that were written, giving the history of the Chinese Jews, literally written in stone, going back 500 years, talking about how they arrived 1,000 years before, and they have these, you know, all kinds of history and hmm. very interesting things. What I didn't know at the time is that in 1850, sorry, 1751, a group of British people came to uh, uh, China and got in contact with the Jews of Kaifeng and said, we want to buy some of your manuscripts. And they bought them. And this was important because oh. there's a lot of floods in Kaifeng. So most of the original manuscripts that were in Kaifeng have been destroyed by a series of floods. But the ones that were brought from London survived. They, they were brought to London? They were from brought Kaifeng? to London. Well, first they were brought to Shanghai, and then from Shanghai they were purchased by uh, the society in London, a Bible society. And then in the 1920s, they were purchased from this London society by the Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati. Oh. Now that was the place I went. Uh, to see um, uh, what's called HUC number one, which is one of the important manuscripts of the Tanakh, from uh, which isn't from China, right? That's that's from uh, land of Israel or somewhere in that area from much earlier. These manuscripts are much later. They're from uh, approximately the 17th century, but they were copied by generation after generation by these Chinese Jews who over time had been cut off. They were cut off from the main population of Jews. They had these manuscripts of the Bible and they didn't even necessarily know what they were copying, but Chinese culture is really good at reproducing things. And that's because they have such a complicated language, uh, written language, so they have to be able to really be really good at reproducing things. So mm -hmm. they saw these Hebrew letters and characters and they reproduced them. And I could now pick up a Chinese Bible from the 17th century, produced by a Chinese Jew in Kaifeng, and I can read it like I'm reading an Israeli newspaper or like I'm reading a, a manuscript from a thousand years ago. It's it's perfect Hebrew. Now, and, now when you when you visit yeah, them, yeah. Uh, are you speaking Hebrew to them? So one of the groups I spoke to in English, the other one I spoke to Chinese through an interpreter, but they were learning Hebrew and we could write in Hebrew and they could understand some of the written Hebrew and I could understand what they were writing in Hebrew, which is pretty cool. Wow. Um, you know, and I'm meeting these Chinese Jews and look, they look Chinese because they've been intermarrying there for centuries. Mm -hmm. And I, But I asked this one woman, I said, when did you discover that you were Jewish? And she said, I, I don't, what do you mean? When I was two or three years old, my parents told me I was Jewish. Well, how did your parents know? because they've always been Jewish. We have, we have a Jewish character in our surname. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. And they told me about how there's character specific to the Jews. When I was in Kaifeng, Michael, they took me to a place called Torah Learning Lane. There's a street in Kaifeng, China called Torah Learning Lane. Uh, and they were kind of known by the local population who didn't really understand what Jews were, but they knew those are the strange people who don't eat pork which you have to understand, for a Chinese person not eating pork, it'd be like if you Unheard said- of. <laughs> well, it, it really would be like if American said, look, I don't drink water. It's against my religion to drink water. The Chinese can't understand it. I remember being in China and I would tell people, uh, I, don't, I don't eat pork, and uh, we'll butcher uh, juro, and I, uh, that's my broken Chinese, I don't eat uh, pork meat. And, um, and they would look at me and they'd say, how are you alive? And I'd say, I'd seem to be doing pretty well, <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> maybe, uh, yeah. Anyway, so when I was there in Kaifeng, I didn't know about these manuscripts. And even when I visited the Hebrew Union College, I didn't get to see everything. So I knew about, I actually knew about some of their Chinese manuscripts, but not their Bible manuscripts from China. Mm. So now these manuscripts have gone online. And for the first time a few weeks ago, I was able to see them online manuscripts that came out of Kaifeng in 1751. They were written probably 100 years before that. And they have the vowels. Can I show the people no, what they please, have? please, please. Uh, all right, so they have, they, uh, let me pull it up right here. Um, 
Here it is, oh, this is really cool, look at this. This is the, uh, from the, univer from the uh, uh, Hebrew Union College, it says Hebrew manuscripts from China, right? And it's one of many manuscripts, so this is uh, you know, a particular manuscript, 59. And then here is a section of the Torah from China, and I can read this like I'm reading my Tanakh, uh, printed in Jerusalem, and it uh, says, You will make, uh, do for yourself the feast of Sukkot when you gather in your, the grain from your uh, uh, threshing floor, etc. And let me skip ahead, and it says, Shivat yamim tachog. Seven days you will celebrate La Yehovah, to Yehovah, and there are the full vowels, Yehovah. And by the way, uh, guys, go uh, watch one of the previous uh, episodes I did uh, where I talk about the B-52 bomber. That's this phenomenon that I'm not, we don't have time to get into today, but I also have a, a, a teaching on my website, on called mm -hmm. Cutting Through the Confusion from the Show Me State. I go into a lot more detail about the B-52 bomber. This is an example not only of Yehovah with the full vowels, uh, but what I call the B-52 bomber phenomenon. And there it is, La Yehovah. Here is a second manuscript from a second scroll and you can see it's a completely different handwriting, right? A second Jewish scribe in Kaifeng. And this is Kai from Fung. China. Uh, China. This is from China, China, from Kaifeng. It's a different passage. It says, Ki tidol nedo la Yehovah Elohecha, when you make an oath to Yehovah, your God, and etc. And we have earlier on the page, it says, Beit Yehovah, the house of Yehovah. And it says, uh, Yehovah Elohecha, again, Yehovah, your God. Here, even in Kaifeng, maybe not even fully understanding what they were copying, but they were preserving much, I mean, they were cut off, right? So they only yeah. had the much earlier manuscripts they brought with them from Afghanistan and before that from Persia and eventually from the land of Israel as they migrated east. These, these, these bands of Jewish merchants and eventually settling in China, they brought with them these Hebrew manuscripts and they copied them diligently and I can read it perfectly and it has the vowels Yehovah, even in China. This is within our, our included, included within our 1,721. And, and Michael, to me, and I wanna get to this in a future episode if you'll allow me, but there's this prophecy that just burns in my heart. It's Malachi chapter one, verse 11, and here, Michael, it's a fulfillment of the prophecy, this Chinese manuscript, Malachi 1.11. Let me read it to the people. It says, um, says here, Malachi 1.11. Uh, okay, let me pull it up. It says, from the rising of the sun. Let me read, can I read it in Hebrew? Please it do. It says here Please in do. Hebrew, shemesh. For from the place of the rising of the sun, somebody say China, the admivo'o, until the place of its setting, somebody say Europe at the time of, the, uh, right. of the known world, gadol shmi by goyim, my name is great among the nations, u'bechol makom muktar mugash li shmi, u'mincha tehoran, and uh, every place, uh, this is really interesting, Mike. I'm going to say that for next time when we, when we talk about this. And it says again, Ki gadol shmi bagoyim, for my name is great among the nations. Amar Yehovah tzvaot, says Yehovah of hosts. There's this prophecy in Malachi. Malachi lived approximately in 400 BC, and he prophesied that God's name would be great from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting. And I could just imagine the people in Israel at the time of Malachi who heard this in Jerusalem, and in their limited understanding of the world, maybe they thought this meant the, you know, the rising of the sun, may, some, some place as far away as you know, maybe Babylon or Persia, which they were familiar with, and maybe as far away as Greece, which they had some vague knowledge of, they couldn't have imagined their wildest dreams that what Malachi was talking about was the entire world, as far yeah. away as China, as far away as Iceland. We did a program about that in the Karite Files. We talked about finding Yehovah's name in Iceland yeah, with yeah. the full vowels and, and, and his name being glorified there. And now the entire world, Malachi's words are true. Michael, we only have a very short time. Can you just briefly tell people about what I did to try to glorify Yehovah's name and spread this message. Well, uh, yeah, I, I want you to come back next time can and, you show and, the and go into and we'll this tell them what it because is. Oh, oh, because here it is. Uh, this is uh, from Denmark. It's this a, is it's a uh, coin from the 1640s from the King of Denmark, and it says on it, guys. It says Yehovah with the full vowels a fulfillment of the prophecy of Malachi. For years I wanted this coin and I contacted a mint in Utah and had them reproduce this coin as a silver round with one troy ounce of silver. And on the back of the coin, what did I put? The verse 
For Malachi in Hebrew, Gadol Shmi Bagoyim. My name is great among the nations. And guys, you won't believe the story behind this coin and the silver round of how it ties in to the very fabric of the history of the United States of America and it's a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. We'll talk about that next time. Would you close with the ironic blessing? I will, Michael. The proper ironic blessing. Yehovah, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be here with Michael and share the fulfillment of the words of your prophecy. Yevarechecha, Yehovah v'yishmerecha. Yehovah bless you and keep you. Ya'er Yehovah panav elecha v'yichunecha. Yehovah shine his face towards you and be gracious towards you. Yisa Yehovah panav elecha. Yehovah lift his face towards you. V'yasem lecha shalom. And may he give you peace. May he give you shalom. Amen. Well, you've just begun the adventure. Ladies and gentlemen, join us again here next week for Shabbat Night Live. Shavuot Tov. Have a good week, and we'll see you here then. Thanks, Nehemiah.